Anti-Semitism, Real and Imagined Responses to the Canadian Parliamentary Coalition to Combat Anti-Semitism. Um, I became involved uh, about two years ago with a project to set up a new news commentary website. Um, the uh, guiding spirit behind this, uh, I suppose in a very perverse and indirect way, was uh, Lord Black. Uh, my, my then merely acquaintance, uh, Professor Muhammad El Masri, who is a very distinguished uh, uh, scientist in the field of microelectronics, fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and so on, uh, and, a, and a wonderful man, um, had written when he was uh, president of the Canadian Islamic Congress to Lord Black, saying, um, "Listen, the the news coverage of." Uh, issues relating to uh, Muslims and relating in particular to the Middle East uh, appears to me to be radically unbalanced. Um, I'd be most grateful if you could uh, uh, <laughs> devote your, the energies of your immense mind, he didn't say that, this is my silly ironies, uh, to, to correcting this, this situation. And to his astonishment, he got a letter back from, uh, from Lord Black saying, uh, you know, I own newspapers because I, I'm paraphrasing again, because uh, I like to hear my own opinions uh, uh, propagated and magnified and, and, and amplified. Uh, if you want to hear, if you want to have your own opinions uh, disseminated, why don't you start something of your own? Uh, and hence, hence the, the, the uh, Canadian Charger, which uh, has now been online for um, a little over a year and aspires to join uh, other uh, worthy, um, I hope we can conclude ourselves in that category, uh, if you like, um, uh, counterbalances to the sometimes or perhaps always overwhelming weight of the corporate media in this country. So we decided, well, this, this does look, this, this feels like and I'll explain in a minute why we, why we felt with some degree of certainty that critical submissions sent to this parliamentary coalition were not going to receive even the beginnings of an attentive hearing. Uh, we thought that this, this, this is lo looking like an act of censorship. By the time we'd received half a dozen or so texts sent to us by people who'd, who'd submitted uh, um, statements to the, to the coalition's a call for input, um, saying, will you publish this online because we don't think it's got a chance otherwise of being, of being heard or read. We thought, let's make a little booklet, uh, print up a bunch of these things, send them first to uh, members of parliament so they know that uh, their colleagues are engaged in a kind of censorship, uh, get them into the Canadian media um, and, and share them with activist groups and so on. And then it occurred to me, well, well, I, I took on the job. I thought it would be uh, a fairly straightforward, simple thing. Uh, I thought, it, this has to have a decent introduction. Where does this CPCCA come from? Uh, and, and who, what are the views of the people who are its guiding lights? I'll have something to say about that in a moment. Uh, I thought, it needs to have, this is, this is not a subject, I thought, that, that we should be engaging in without also engaging as fully as possible within confined space in the crucial question of the history of anti-Semitism in this country. And I'll just pause for a moment uh, by way of saying this is a disgraceful history. Canada in the 1930s when Jewish refugees were struggling frantically to escape from Hitlerism, generally the, the, the position of the, the English-speaking countries uh, was, was poor. Uh, it, it was uh, all of the English-speaking countries, and others as well, have, uh, I think, a major stain on their history in relation to this. But on a per capita basis, Canada accepted approximately one-fifth as many Jewish refugees as did the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, and Australia. I mean, the, the countries that most easily are, are comparable to us. One-fifth as many. Uh, there's the, the famous and appalling case of the motor vessel St. Louis, which left Hamburg with uh, a human cargo of uh, 
approximately 950 Jewish refugees, uh, was turned away in Havana, it was turned away in American ports, and it was turned away uh, from Canada. People who had been within sight of safety three times over, and the final time within sight of safety in Canada, were turned away by our openly racist government and our openly racist immigration bureaucrats. 250 at least of those people, I mean, they, 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 they returned to countries in Western Europe, which a year later were overrun by the Wehrmacht. 250 of them died in the, in the Shoah. Uh, so there's that history, which, uh, I mean, I, I wasn't in any way contributing to scholarship in that sense. There's, there's very good scholarship uh, on the subject. Um, I, I added to that chapter as well, um, again, not in any way original scholarship, some comments on uh, Canada's, Canada's subsequent role in the, uh, in the foundation of Israel, which was, of course, very important. Lester B. Pearson, uh, Chief Justice uh, Ivan Rand, were key figures in the United Nations deliberations that led to the foundation of Israel. And it's, it's very clear, and again, this is, this is the work of historians on whom I was drawing, it's very clear that um, Canada's position here was, was uh, far from benevolent. Uh, Canada did not open the doors after the war, after the Shoah, after the Holocaust, to Jewish immigration until 1948. Uh, during that period, the Canadian government and Canadian diplomats were, were working very actively toward uh, the foundation of the State of Israel, in part with the clear intention that if they could divert uh, European Jewish refugees, survivors, into settling into Israel, they wouldn't come to Canada. Uh, and that's, that's very clear from the documentary evidence. My second chapter looks at the question of the evidence that uh, needs to be considered in relation to the claim of the CPCCA that they were setting up a parliamentary inquiry because there is a terrifying resurgence of anti-Semitism in this country. I think that, I mean, one of the things that was immediately bizarre about the CPCCA's opening claims was that they were announcing their conclusions before having, presumably, begun their research, certainly before having begun to collect public input or to hold an inquiry. The uh, final chapter deals with, it deals with a number of issues that have directly to do with free speech. Uh, free speech in particular within Canadian universities. And I deal also with some instances of uh, challenges uh, or, hmm, one might say, attempts to eliminate uh, free speech within uh, the American Academy as well. I deal also with uh, what I think I'd like to focus on most, um, uh, most directly today, which is the rhetoric and ideology of the so-called new anti-Semitism. Now, I think it's important to understand what, uh, what is meant by this terminology. Um, Norman Finkelstein, who perhaps, uh, uh, whose work uh, many of you know, has uh, in his book Chutzpah said, uh, look, this is actually, it's actually neither new nor about anti-Semitism. It's a term that, was, uh, that came into circulation in 1973 in a book written by the uh, then chief people in the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith in the United States. And uh, I think Finkelstein's analysis of this is, is, is very astute. He says, uh, when you read that book closely, and I have looked at it, uh, what you find is that they are really concerned with deflecting pressure against Israel and Israel's American supporters in particular, uh, pressure toward uh, a retreat from the occupied territories. Now, at that point, the occupation was only, what, some, not quite seven years old. Uh, we're talking about the territories occupied after the Six Days War of 1967, of course. Um, and uh, what, was, what, what is, I think, clearly evident in that book is that the, the attempt to expand 
the notion of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic hate speech to incorporate uh, speech against Israel is designed as a way of deflecting this criticism and, in effect, turning the tables on people who are exerting that pressure who, who after, after, of course, the 1973 war, I think that, that pressure became more intense uh, perhaps as a result of that war and in the wake of that war. Um, and I, I think it's accurate to say that the term new antisemitism in all of its usages since that time has carried, has carried that intent and that flavor. Now, um, what does it mean when um, two people whom I'll, I'll have more to say about shortly, uh, Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and Multiculturalism, Jason Kenney, uses this term, or when um, McGill Law Professor uh, Erwin Kotler, Member of Parliament, former Justice Minister, uses this term. What it is bound up with is another term that I believe uh, may be Professor Kotler's coinage, lawfare. He certainly uses it with some frequency. Uh, by deploying this term, what Professor Kotler means is that human rights activists, people who stand up and say, uh, on the basis of my commitment to ethical principles and to universal principles of human rights, the Fourth Geneva Convention, whatever, uh, I, w I am protesting the behavior of the State of Israel in, in the occupation, in, in continuing the occupation, and in various aspects of its behavior relating to it. Um, the reply of, of the exponents of the new anti-Semitism is to say, well, let's look into this sort of thing closely. What was the, what was the kind of, if you like, traditional anti-Semitism? It was uh, an expression of hatred designed to prevent Jews from participating as citizens, designed to disable them, to isolate them, to make them objects of scorn, of hatred, and persecution. What is this new antisemitism? Well, it's the same motive, it's the same vileness, it's the same vicious hatred, but directed in a cunning and sophisticated way. Uh, Professor Kotler likes to use that word sophisticated. Uh, against the collectivity of the Jewish people. In other words, against the state that is the expression of their collective desire. And it's designed to prevent that state from participating fully in the family of nations. So there's, there's, an, there's an analog then between, uh, which has been constructed between an attempt to prevent individuals from, from being fully citizens to preventing a collectivity from being um, fully a member of the family of nations. Uh, and this, this is uh, it's a paraphrase I'm offering you. Uh, I have, if you want to check the, the details of uh, his words, they're, they're fully quoted in the book. Um, now, what this means then is that a claim is being made that the traditional tropes of anti-Semitism are being mobilized in uh, a kind of displaced form in the new anti-Semitism, such that, I'll t uh, let's take the most vicious, uh, of these tropes, the most, uh, uh, the most bizarre, if you like, and the most disgusting, uh, the blood libel. The blood libel, of course, has roots in, uh, it has roots in Christian anti-Semitism, most obviously, uh, beginning in the text of the Gospels, in which, uh, as you get more and more distant from whatever the historical event was, the execution of Jesus of Nazareth, Pontius Pilate, who's quite clearly, and he's, he's a very well-documented historical figure and a brute, um, becomes progressively a nicer guy. And the weight of guilt that the Jews are made in these texts to take upon their heads, let his blood be upon our heads, and those of our descendants, is made increasingly heavier. <laughs> 